Welcome to the putback on SNY.TV here with Ian Begley. We are here to break things. Nick's down here for the next 30 minutes or so. I've got two great guests with me. First, John Macri, Nick's Film School. Uh, John Macri, fantastic newsletter, uh, almost daily. Uh, over the course of really 12 months a year. And he puts out uh, fantastic podcasts, Nick Film School. So uh, I'm sure you already know about him. If not, go ahead and check them out. They have a, uh, a watch party, uh, Nick's Film School, and that is ahead of that Milwaukee game tomorrow. It's going to be at T Squared uh, Social at 630. They're also giving away tickets to Nick's Bulls next week. So keep an eye on that. We've also got the great Sky Zoo. Sky Zoo. Uh, come joining us again. We're happy to have him. He's got a new album out, uh, Keep Me Company. It drops everywhere on November 29th, Black Friday. New single, The Workload, uh, featuring Method Man, came out last week. A lot of buzz, a lot of acclaim there. Uh, so two great guests with us. And as always, we're going to start with the baseline here. And right now, this Nick team coming off of a 2-2 two and two road trip, uh, losing to Atlanta last night. Losing to Houston, probably could have finished 3-1 and one on this road trip, maybe even 4-0 and oh, considering how it started, uh, but it ended poorly. And Skyzu, you were in Atlanta for that game last night. Yeah. I think Trey Young was talking to you when he said, <laughs> go home, get out of here. Uh, what, what, what was it like in the building uh, late in that game as the Knicks kind of fell apart? Yeah, it, it seemed like it. It seemed like, you know, the thing about going to a Knicks game in Atlanta, you feel like you're at the Garden, right? And and why Trey did that is because literally in the middle of the fourth quarter, it felt like we was at the Garden. The entire arena was going, let's go, Knicks. Let's go, Knicks. <laughs> I mean, they were booing uh, Zachary Richeshay at the line. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so to be home and to have that energy is wild. So I got why Trey did that. Um, it, it felt like a rough night the entire game. Even the moments where we were coming back, the moments where we had a lead, it was one of those nights where the energy felt like we might not have it tonight, you know? And I didn't know how legit Zachary Richeshay was. He's legit. Every time he got the rock, it dropped, man. But, um, you know, with us, it, it just felt like one of those nights. Cat had an amazing evening uh, quietly. It didn't even look like it. You look up at the scoreboard, you're like, they got 34 and 15 or 16, whatever it was. And it was wild. The energy, of course, is always at any game that the Knicks are playing, but especially, you know, uh, at State Farm, it, there's us, we're there. But, you know, the, the Hawks fans, they let us have it at the end. They, when we were walking out, it was, go back to New York. Y'all are why traffic is bad. You know, it was crazy. <laughs> it, was, it, it, it was wild. But uh, it was dope to be there. Was, but, yeah, they, they felt that, yo, know, literally, it was, let's go, Knicks, the entire arena on the road, you know. So, but we – as a team, they didn't give it back. You know, they, there were some moments where it felt like it might go there, but I swear the entire night, it just felt like it was a losing night. Man, and, uh, and John, your newsletter, your, your newsletter was titled Implosion mm -hmm. uh, this morning, mm -hmm. pretty aptly put. The, the late game execution from the Knicks and also the early game struggles, putting themselves in a hole, which you saw against Houston, you saw against Atlanta. Let's actually start there. What what are your concerns, and, and why is, why are we seeing that from this group early on in terms of uh, hurting themselves early with turnovers and getting behind significantly these last two nights? I, I look at this Knicks team right now, and like this is a analogy that's been used uh, before, often describing like. Uh, rookies, you know, it, whether in basketball or any sport, they're like a baby giraffe right now where you got, you know, these limbs and they're flying everywhere. Uh, sometimes they're working in unison. And when they do, you could kind of see the vision, right? You could kind of see what the front office was thinking when they put this team together. Um, and then uh, there are times where it's like, oh, you know, everything's going in, in a different direction and it looks clunky. And nobody is really uh, pulling their oars in, in the same direction. And I don't like to me, if I was to boil down their struggles into one kind of thing, it's just that like these are guys who are not used to playing together as a unit. And I would even go further than that and say, you know, on defense, certainly kind of an entirely 
new way of going about trying to defend teams like the, the the back line of rim protection was always the saving grace right no matter what happened out on the perimeter you always had that back line now it's the opposite now if your perimeter defense is not good nothing nothing's good gonna ha- is gonna happen when they get to the interior and on the offensive end you know this has been Jalen Brunson's show for two years but it, Last year, it reached a level where after, you know, the injuries certainly to Julius Randle and OJ Anobi, J- uh, Jalen Brunson was the highest usage player in the league, you know, and and to go from that to now, you could argue that Jalen Brunson is no longer the most uh, threatening offensive player on the team. If you just go and look at Carl Anthony Towns and all of the different things that he could do. No, I'm not saying Towns is better than Brunson or that Brunson shouldn't be, you know, have the ball a lot. He absolutely should. But to try to figure out, okay, I need to figure out how we feature Towns in this offense, how we potentially run through Towns in this offense some, sometimes, you know, to say nothing of your Macau Bridges and OG Ananobis of the world and Josh Hart. Um, well, at the same time, like, they're only going to be at their best when he is hitting shots. You know, I'm looking at it right now. This is a guy who's never shot below 46% from the short mid-range in his career. He's hitting 37% from that distance. He is very clearly out of sorts. And I think he's searching. I think you saw him trying to find it. And that results in some turnovers. It results in some stagnant possessions. I'm not putting it all on him. But ultimately, you know, you 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 go as far as the head of the snake uh, is going to take you. And, and it's all just kind of off right now. Yeah, I... I see what you guys are seeing and i would say too that you know with jalen brunson i think it's an adjustment period but i think he's he's shown you enough more than enough in a nick jersey to to deserve the benefit of the doubt after seven games here i think that he's a player who can adjust over the course of a season uh is committed committed to winning here committed to doing what it takes to win here so i would expect him to make those necessary adjustments nonetheless um it's something to keep an eye on here early in this season the way he is shooting at his comfort level with his teammates and carl anthony towns being uh i guess the primary primary teammate there because you need that pick and roll to be great and you need the the combination of those two guys to be great uh and cat so far he's put up some big Big scoring games. I'm, I'm curious, Sky, your thoughts so far on Towns, what you've seen from him uh, just in the context of this big trade the Knicks made on the eve of training camp. I think for it to be a start, for there to be, you know, little time for the chemistry and getting together, he's done great. The numbers are there. I said on a few other platforms before, the, the biggest thing that Cat brings to us is the fact that even though he's a star and, in my opinion, a superstar, somebody that we've been searching for for a while, the best element to him is that he's not going to come in wanting everything, right? Like, he's good taking a backseat role. You can see it. He's not asking for the ball. He's not demanding it. He's not shaking up the locker room. He's not doing all of these different things that could cause disruption. And I think that, though, is leading to nights where the offense never flows to him or, or nights where he's getting three shots in the fourth quarter and things that just shouldn't happen. And I think a lot of that is because he is so willing to play his role and be reserved and kick back and just get in where he fits in for lack of a better term. Those are great attributes because it'll make sure that the trade and everything happens seamlessly. It'll make sure that the players continue to get along and and the locker room is right. There's a lot of superstars that would have walked in and said, look, I'm used to being the number one option and being the man where I came from that has to continue here. So he was able to, take the back seat due to his personality and demeanor and how he's able to carry it, which is great. But now we're seeing where, man, he's got to get that ball more. He's, you got to feed it through him, man. This is a guy who literally can give you 30 and 15 and you don't even realize it. This is a guy who is the best seven footer we've had since Pat, without a doubt, at least on the talent side. So we've got to utilize that and don't take the fact that he isn't going to force the issue to have the ball and everything flow through him. For granted, like Brunson or whoever, Hart, everyone's got to do a better job, especially Brunson. And I'm a huge Brunson fan, but to be the starting PG and in, in, in the Clyde of our generation, you've got to get this guy incorporated more because he can show you that he can do it, especially on the offensive end. Yeah, there's there's been a lot to like so far with Townsend Scott. To your point, the mentality that he has, I think, is important. He refers to Jalen Brunson as cap a lot of the time, and he's right. you know talking about how you got to get out of the way and let Brunson do what he does best and try to fit in and, and to have that mentality 
you know, it's going to go a long way, I think, uh, for the development of this team and, and for the way he can uh, fit in on this team. He, he's got the right attitude. And the other night, it was a couple, it was actually a couple weeks ago now, they were home and he had, I think, eight shots in a loss against Cleveland. And, you know, we were asking him about shot attempts and he said, guys, we let a 14 point lead, you know, go in the late third quarter. I'm more thinking about that, concerned about that than anything about shot attempts. So he, he he's about the right things with regards to winning um, the defense. Uh, John, you know, I think you've seen him in drop. Uh, I think the adjust over the course of the year, I thought Steve Jones had a really smart breakdown of what he's seen from the Nick defense so far on his show. Um, but, you know, with Bridges and with Ananobi, uh, it doesn't seem like even those guys are, are have their timing where it needs to be or have no. their cohesion where it needs to be um, at this point in the season. Not surprising, new team, seven games into the year. But your thoughts on the two wings defensively? Yeah. I saw the Steve Jones uh, clip you tweeted out. It was perfect. Uh, our own uh, Benji Ridholtz, uh, who obviously does does great work, you know very well, uh, yes. put out a couple of clips uh, earlier today where OG Ananobi and Mikel Bridges, two guys. I mean, OG Ananobi. I think a lot of people feel that he he could he might if he ever stays healthy could win a Defense Player of the Year award one day. Uh, Mikel Bridges finished second in Defense Player of the Year voting once. So th the capabilities are there. And like the clips that he had pointed out, these are just two guys getting mixed up in terms of do we switch? When do we switch? Um, you know, if we're if we're peeling off, like you know, wh wh when does that happen? What what does that look like? Um, they'll get there. I think the tough part right now. And look, I, I want to be very clear. Like, Cat, uh, I, I know on my show last night, Cat was getting a lot of the blame, and a lot of people were looking at the the drop coverage and saying, what the what the heck is this? This is not a winning formula. He's out there trying. Um, I, that's my perception. You, reasonable minds could disagree, I suppose. I think he's out there. He's given a great effort. His block on Trey Young, that was originally called the goaltend, that should have been the defining defensive possession of, of their season. And it instead, you know, essentially got wiped away. Um, and he, he's not making mental blunders. You've had a couple of fouls here and there. So I'm not putting this on Cat. You, you knew what you were getting with Cat. None of the, what Cat's doing is a surprise. The whole formula only works if your wings are as good as they are supposed to do because that is what puts pressure on the perimeter players, and it doesn't make things easy for them to even get into the lane. And that's how this defense needs to work. Um, the other thing I'll just say in regards to to Cat that I like because I, I really I can't say enough how impressed I have been by him. You know, your colleague Stefan Bondi wrote a, a great article before the season talking about how Cat's toughness had been questioned in the past. And he never really saw that, that, that uh, he didn't get where the soft thing came from. Watching him through seven games, I, I think he's plenty tough. And, and I know there's a lot of people out there who are worried that this team has lost some of the ethos from last year. You know, some of that toughness and grit that define them. Yes, they're a more finesse team now. Yes, they're going to win with offense before defense. But I think like the way he goes up for rebounds, I, I, I am incredibly impressed by all of that. And I think it just comes down to figuring out the, you know, fine tuning it, you know, like stuff screens like him, him in the pick and roll with Brunson. And that's and that's where this team is going to, um, you know, excel. You know, you, you look at that pick and roll and you think about Hartenstein and, and the screening chemistry that Brunson yep. and Hartenstein had last year in particular. And that took some time to develop. That didn't happen day one with those two guys it took weeks months repetition uh i think for hardenstein to figure out where jalen wanted to be screened where to be on the floor how to position himself so i think that's another thing that you know if if everything is going right and things are going according to plan with this team that screen chemistry with towns and brunson you know will improve over time certainly it's something to keep an eye on because of how good it was with Hartenstein uh, over the course of last year and even before that. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking a lot about Cat. With Jalen, we, you know, we talked about the the scoring and we talked about, the, you know, him fitting in and we talked about last year's team, right, and how this year's team, it, it's a different team, right? The DNA of this team is very different. And so one of the ways it's showing up to me is in the paint. Nick's giving up a lot of paint points in Houston and in Atlanta last night and getting really out rebounded on the offensive glass in particular against that Atlanta team. And, you know, this was something the Knicks held their hang, hung their hat on last year, offensive rebounds, winning the possession battle, creating extra shots, low turnovers, 
we haven't seen that consistently from this group yet. Is it fair to expect that same level uh, on the glass from this team, Sky Zoo, or should we just get used to a different brand of basketball with this team? I would hope so. Um, you know, you got a seven foot one guy in there who's not frail or thin. You know, you got somebody in there who can really go for it. It just makes you wonder what can be when Mitchell Robinson comes back. So when you have the both of them together, kind of a la Cat uh, and, and Rudy Gobert, uh, you know, so now everybody kind of slides back to certain positions. And man, having Cat there and, and he's so. He's so uh, accurate in, in water from from three and seeing it in person is insane. It's just every time it goes up, you feel like it's cash. So if you have that and you have Mitchell and they can sit in there and it really cause disruptions on defense and offense, that'd be great. But, you know, obviously we're a ways from that now. I think it, it could still be expected. You know, I'm old school. I want my seven footers to do seven foot things. You know, I, I'm, I've always looked at positions in basketball to be positions and to be able to pull those things off. So I think we should expect that. And 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 I, I think Cat would expect that from himself, especially being back with Tibbs, knowing who Tibbs is and the regime that he runs and how he wants things. We should expect that for sure. John, your thoughts on the, the DNA of this group, the makeup of this group and the expectations uh, and what it, what it what should look like, what the expectations yeah. should be based on years past. Yeah, I mean, just you know, a couple quick stats on the what you were just talking about. I just looked up on Cleaning the Glass, uh, which is a great stats website. The Knicks right now are sixth in the league in terms of limiting opponents' frequency of shots at the rim. That's obviously excellent. And again, that's that's the blueprint, right? That's that's what they when they when they got these wings and, and they paired Cat with them. They say, well, teams just aren't going to shoot uh, close at the at the rim. The problem is once they get there, teams are hitting uh, their uh, the Knicks are third from the bottom in terms of uh, opponents frequency. Opponents are hitting 72.4 percent of their shots once they get in the restricted area. Now, that's not all on cat. The the Lakers who employ Anthony Davis, pretty good defender. Um, they're only two spots higher than the Knicks. So it, it, it's not completely indicative of towns. There's more than that goes into it. But I do think um, that they need to get at least some of that DNA back. As far as the rebounding, I'm, I'm not I'm not too worried about the rebounding. I think they have good defensive rebounders. I think rebounding, like a lot of the things we're talking about, is the sort of thing that uh, as guys get used to each other will improve. The thing that is going to change is like the offensive rebounding is just never going to be to the level that it was in previous years because you're playing five out now, and it's not really possible to, to, to get that level of offensive rebounds if you got your center a lot of the time uh, behind the three-point arc. I, I to answer the larger question very briefly, I, I and this is I think part of why we're sitting here and we're talking about a three and four team. They're not going to be able to just be a better version of last year's team. They are a fundamentally Ooh. different organism. You have changed out too many of the parts and and changed up too much of the play style to expect it to just be a better version of that. They need to, in a way rediscover who they are and rediscover their formula for winning at both ends. And I know for me before the season, I said, look, if this happens within 20 games, I will count my lucky stars. It might take longer than that. You know, um, it has been brought up many times the, the 2010, 11 heat, what did they start? Nine and eight, you know, and that was like the greatest team, you know, people thought it would be the greatest thing ever. And, and it takes, it takes a while. It takes a while. Yes, and Towns coming in mid-training camp, I think that yeah. matters too. And and so also, you know, Mitchell Robinson, who Sky Zoo brought up, to me this is such a big, not even a, not an elephant in the room at all, but just a big decision that New York has to make here. A, they have to decide how, how can we get Mitchell Robinson to a place where he can, you know, have sustained health. And also, do we believe Mitchell Robinson can have sustained health? And if he can, how does he fit in with this group? What are our options if we were to, to take a look at the open market on Robinson and do teams, you know, think that he can be healthy enough where we can get something back of value? To me, this is this is one of the bigger questions looming with this team, because if the rehab continues to go well, uh, Mitchell Robinson will be ready, uh, whether it's December or January. I think he he internally and their their group internally felt like he was he was feeling pretty good um, now that was recently but now you know you look at Robinson and I think there's going to be teams interested in him and I think that 
you always look for old trade partners. You look at the Detroit Pistons. I think they, mm. I know that some of the people over there are fans of Robinson. So it's just going to be a fascinating uh, question to answer for the organization. Keep Mitchell Robinson, implement him with the group, trade him. What can you get back? And I, I want to know, uh, Sky, for you, you're Leon Rose. Put your Leon Rose suit on right now. What are you doing? <laughs> January, Mitchell Robinson ready to come back. He, he's healthy. He looks like he can give you 20 minutes a night uh, and progress from there. What are you doing? I think you still got to pick up the phone and at least see what the market is like. It's uh, When he's healthy, he's pretty much the perfect cog that you would need to do certain things that clearly we don't have right now being done on the team. But, man, that health is so 50-50. And, you know, I, it's weird talking about health with athletes because it's not their fault. It's how the body is built and DNA and how they're designed. And a lot of it, of course, is how you take care of yourself. But you're talking about knees and ankles and things like that. You know, a lot of that is, you know, something that just isn't in your control. But you got to really take a look. If I'm Leon, I'm, I'm taking a look. It doesn't mean that he's out the door. It doesn't mean bags are packed, but it means we are canvassing the, the 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 landscape and seeing what's what, definitely, because it's just way too too tricky. I mean, if he was a 25 and 12 guy, it may be a little harder to do that. But what he does is very, very important, and you'd like to get that back. But you can find remnants of that, and the health has been so up and down, so far into it. You know, if we were in year one or two, cool, but we're in – what five, if I'm not mistaken, I forgive me. I don't remember offhand, but you got to start looking into it, at least listening and, and seeing what's out there. You know, before we get to some other Knicks takes, uh, we're going to go around the world shortly. But before we do that, remember, keep your questions coming in wherever you're watching the show. Put them in the replies and we'll be getting to them later in this show. But right now. We're going to go around the world. We're going to see what some other analysts, Nick fans out there have to say about this three and four team at this point. Uh, and I think we're going to start out with somebody who's been a big Nick fan uh, over past the past couple of seasons. Hendrick Perkins, mayor of New York. He says, I have real concerns about my Knicks. Three exclamation points. John Macri, time to be concerned after seven games. What say you? Um, I'm very happy that Kendrick Perkins, uh, Q, uh, Q rating went up significantly because he decided, uh, to make one of his dozens of daily outlandish, uh, predictions that Jalen Brunson was one of the best players in the league. And that one came true. So he rode that baby until the wheels fell off and he still riding it and God bless him because that's what gets people to tune into the worldwide leader. Um, I don't care what Kendrick Perkins says. I cannot possibly express how little that it matters to me that Kendrick Perkins thinks that things are, you know, worrisome or whatever. If we were sitting here and we were talking about these very same topics in two months and this team had good health and they had played together for all that time and we were still dealing with these issues, I would absolutely say, Kendrick, you're a hundred percent right. But I, the, the notion that it's time to get significantly worried when every single issue on this team you could point to well if they get a little bit more time they get used to each other a little bit more and they get a little bit healthier and i'm not even saying mitch i'm just talking about get get a campaign i mean campaigns must have let you give get right. pressure to back maybe get either landry shamit or maybe matt ryan works in get a little deeper your starters don't have to play as much um these are all things that will sort themselves out and again we're it's seven games we're talking about seven games. So to ring the alarm bells after seven games, it, it, to me, is... I'm not going to say it's outlandish because there are there's some real stuff here that like, okay, that could be an issue if you don't clean it up. But let's see them have a chance to clean it up before we, we, we start you know pulling the plug here. Sky, you agree? I do, but I, I also feel like it's time to be concerned about being concerned if that makes sense <laughs> um a step before you know what i mean um it is seven games like like jonathan said and and i agree with that it's very very early but you just don't want habits to start forming 
seeing it in person in New York and seeing it in person in Atlanta, they do look a little confused. Obviously, the talent is there. They need to get more reps together, of course. You wish they had a whole summer in training camp and everything to roll. And like you said, throwing them in in the middle of training camp was huge. But it just seems like, hey, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It, it feels like a little bit of that when you watch them. Uh, it, but on paper, I mean, the starting lineup is top three in the league, maybe. <laughs> so, you know, we, we we should and we will be fine. Uh, so I'm, I'm not I'm not ringing the bell for concern yet, but it's on the other end of the room and I'm looking at it. <laughs> Let me put it like that. Yeah, I think uh, I think our buddy Jerry Ferraris guy kind of encapsulates your point when he says Knicks will click, but it's scary waiting for it. There you How go. long do you wait? sky before you start to get worried how long do you wait when if, if this team is hovering around 500 is it mid-december what are we talking about i think new year's i think yeah. new year's uh that's a, a significant amount of time it also lets you know where you are with the trade deadline coming in you know a month and a half after new year's so now you start figuring things out and saying okay what can we do because you know the knicks had a treasure chest for a long time that treasure chest is pretty empty now. We got great return for it, Mikel and Cat and everything like that, but it's pretty empty now. So even if you wanted to say, what are we going to do? You know, some people say, oh, well, Josh Hart should go back to the bench. Okay, well, who's going to start? You don't want to pull Deuce McBride off the bench because he is giving you those minutes. And, man, I don't know what he did over the summer, but his summer was immaculate because every time he touches the rock now, you can bet that he's cashing that in. And um, it's – it's been insane. So you don't want to move him off the bench because your, your bench and point production is coming from him. Who's going to start? You go out there and try to get another starter at the two or another piece to move Mikel back or whatever it is. And, and there's nothing there. So, you know, trade deadline is going to be funny because someone's going to have to go out because they're, it's pretty bare, you know. So uh, I would say New Year's is when you got to really start thinking, all right, we got to be careful now because before you know it, it'll be April and we do not want to be a play-in team. We want to be a top two, three seed in the, in, the, in the Eastern Conference, at least. I think New Year's is when you start seeing what's what. But for now, like Jonathan said, it is seven games. It's not even double digits. You know, let's just keep it where it needs. People are panicking because of the expectations, because of how talented the roster is. You know, if we had a mediocre starting five, it'd be different. We have a starting five that can really, really compete. So you're expecting things right away. Sky Zoo, keep me company, his album drops on november 29th black friday yeah. be sure black to friday. keep an eye out for that and and john quickly man just tell me what's your date what's your expiration date on i'm not worried yet <laughs> um yeah i don't think new year's is crazy i'd probably go a little, for as much as i'm preaching preaching patience i would probably go a little bit earlier than that i think the sort of the things that you're seeing in terms of you know defenders getting confused about who's switching and when to switch and stuff like uh, I think 20 games, 25 games uh, is fine. I think the the bigger thing that I'm wondering about is can the offense really start to click in a way that I just don't feel like we've seen yet. Now, I am saying that cognizant of the fact that this is the fourth best offense in the NBA. Um, so, like, that's not nothing. I know they're first in the league in threes, and that number will come down. But I expect the fact that they will um, – you know, start to get a little bit more cohesive. Jalen Brunson will start to hit some shots that he normally hits. Um, you know, that'll that'll balance out the the three point regression that is surely coming. Um, I I I, I want to that. I think I give me like twenty games for for that. Fifteen twenty games to start to see repeatable repeatable. I'll use Skyzu's word because it was a good word. It was repeatable habits. You know, and and there's no coach in the NBA who talks about habits more than Tom Thibodeau, um, and building those habits from training camp and and then continuing to work on them th throughout the year, because I think the thing you don't want to happen, and we know how things get, and you, I mean you know better than anyone how things get in this organization when things are not going well, you don't you don't want to get to the point where you you have fallen to the point where there's there's finger pointing, and there's like blame being tossed around. And there are like fundamental questions about things that I, I don't 
I, I, I'm still, I'm obviously a believer in this team, so I don't think there should be any of those fundamental questions. I like what they did. I like what the direction they're going. But that kind of stuff tends to pop up once you start losing too many games. So I think you want to avoid that. That's why, you know, it's early in the season. But these next couple of games, Milwaukee, Indiana, Philadelphia, these are important games. You know, at the very, like you want to be ideally five and five at least after ten games. Can can you get there? And you guys, uh, John mentioning twenty twenty five games reminded me of the Kemba year. It was early on, yeah. and after a bad loss, I asked Thibodeau about, "Hey, you think it could take twenty twenty five games for these guys to really get it together?" Some people have mentioned that. And he was not happy with that premise. I don't, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I remember how angry he was. And I remember how quickly that press conference ended after that question. So, hmm. you know, we're talking about the, the longer term, them figuring it out. I don't think Tom Thibodeau is thinking that way at all. So no. he wants to get this thing turned around Friday. Milwaukee coming to town. Uh, Nick Film School hosting a watch party before that Bucks game and for that Bucks game at T Squared yeah, Social, 6 30 p.m. kicks off, giving out Nick's Bulls tickets uh, that game next week. Uh, Giannis coming to town. Now, before the cat trade, there was a, uh, always going to be discussions about Giannis and his future and potentially New York. Uh, I, I think there was real stuff there in terms of Giannis. Uh, if he was going to leave Milwaukee, New York kind of being on his radar. And if you want to know about his mentality, just go back two summers when he said, I'm committed to winning. I want to be somewhere where everyone's committed to winning. Uh, if this team around me is not committed to winning, then maybe I would look somewhere else. That's paraphrasing, but he basically said that. So, you know, the, the clock is ticking on Giannis. Uh, there was a, a report from uh, my buddy Mark Stein about the Knicks you know, seeing Carl Towns as uh, maybe a piece to flip for Giannis. And maybe it wasn't the Knicks seeing it that way. Maybe it was other teams hypothesizing. I, I mean, I think that you, you're talking about something that is just not realistic at all. The Knicks don't have the assets to get involved in that kind of a discussion with Milwaukee for a player like Giannis because the draft capital is not there. Now, you know, does Milwaukee say, hey, you know, give us – OG and, and Mikhail and, and we can talk maybe, but like, I think that the offers for a Giannis, if it came down to it, would be far superior to what New York could offer. Also, I think they're all in with this group for a reason because they believe in it. It's there. I don't think the thought is, Hey, let's wait, you know, for the next move. I think this is, they want to see what this is and they want to see this work. So the Giannis stuff to me, it, it's a little bit of a, a fantasy land, but, um, nonetheless, it's a it's a talking point as it always is in this league. Mm -hmm. Now we are going to go to the what we learned segment, and that is presented by SUNY Binghamton University. Uh, Binghamton University was named the top school in the SUNY system, according to recent rankings from the Wall Street Journal and Forbes. You visit Binghamton.edu for more. Now, what we learned earlier this week about the Knicks transactions, to me, uh, it's telling. Because when you sign Matt Ryan to that non-guaranteed one-year deal, what you're able to do is you're still able to create flexibility, enough flexibility under that second apron to go ahead and re-sign a Landry Shamit. Uh, assuming Shamit's rehab continues to go well on that dislocated right shoulder, uh, I do think that's uh, one kind of avenue that the Knicks are open to. If Shamit continues to progress well, then then you can take Matt Ryan, uh, waive him from this current contract, and then sign him to a two-way, keep him on the roster, and you have enough room under that second apron to add Shamit. Remember, Shamit penciled in as a rotation player before he got hurt in the preseason. So, look, I, I do think that if that everything continues to pace with his rehab, that is an avenue that the Knicks will explore. You know, we'll see what they get from Matt Ryan. Maybe, who knows, maybe Matt Ryan comes in. He's situational right now. Maybe he comes in and he lights it up and the Knicks can't afford to cut him because someone else is going to claim him on waivers. There's a lot of different elements there, but I do think you keep an eye on Shamit returning to this team if he's healthy as a distinct possibility. Uh, let's get into Tom Thibodeau, guys. Tom Thibodeau, the the losses are always going to be put on him, more or less, and he's not going to get a ton of credit for the wins. That's how it works in pro sports, particularly in New York. Uh, but from what you've seen, Sky, what you saw firsthand in Atlanta last night, 
Tibbs, is, does he need to do something different with the rotation? Is he right to just ride this thing out, particularly Jericho Sims, until guys get healthy and the team gets whole? What are your thoughts? I think the Sims thing is the only thing that you can kind of really do something with because we are so thin when you look at what we have, the injuries, the players we lost in the trade, et cetera, et cetera. Sims is the only piece that you can do something with. Everyone is, you know, the, what do they call it, the uh, the, the Huck Porty Hive? <laughs> you know, so, you know, he, he he's shown that he does deserve some minutes. I was always a big Sims believer from the, from the beginning because I, I liked his athleticism and, and what it looked like he could be. Uh, I think this is year four, if I'm not mistaken, three or four. So it's been a little while, a lot of training, a lot of different things going on, and we're not seeing what we hope we would see. I think you do got to consider something like that as far as the rotation. I still would like to see him get minutes, but there's games where it's like this is a game where we've got it way out of, out of the lead or we're going in this direction or that direction. There's room to let Huck Porty come in and, and show you what he can do and show you what he's made of. Um, other than that, I don't know rotation-wise where else they can go because we are so thin at the moment. Right. Right, right. I, I don't think there's a lot of directions to go there. You could look at the closing lineups. You can look at substitution patterns, but everything is so kind of out of whack uh, because of injuries, out of whack from what they thought they had coming into the year. So uh, I, I'm, I'm with you on that, Sky. And then OG and Anobi, um, we talked about some of the defensive miscues that uh, Benji Rittenholz pointed out on Twitter, but by and large, I think he's been the most consistent Nick in this early season. John, what do you think about that? What do you think? What do you think about what you've seen from OG so far? Uh, totally, uh, I would agree with that. I think the shooting has has come around uh, after he started off the the early season a, a little bit slow, um, and him being able to. Uh, consistently drain threes not only corner threes but he's also hit some that were that have been outside the corners which i mean you absolutely love to see because that has not been an area of strength for him traditionally throughout his career um you know uh puts the ball on the floor occasionally sometimes that goes better than other times but just his ability to continue to show that he could do that that he could be a threat if you if you give him a hard close out like those are all important things and then obviously the defense i mean he will do two or three things a game that you swear you've never seen before other other than maybe you know from him uh in another uh, another game he just has an uncanny ability to know exactly where to be and because of his combination of size and his ability to and his quickness and his ability to move around screens I, re I mean, I've said this before. I really don't think there's another defender in the league like him. That is not to say that he's the best defender in the entire league, but I don't think it was a, a an accident where GMs around basketball before the season in the GM poll voted him as the second most versatile defender in the NBA. I think that's that's you've seen that play out. Unfortunately, there's only one of them, you know, <laughs> and Ooh. and I don't I don't want to make that like a disparaging comment about Mikael Bridges, but I, I think if you're looking at the two of them and you're saying, okay, which one has had the stronger start to the season defensively, I don't think there's any question that 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 it's OG Ananobi. Right. Uh, yeah, if, go ahead, Sky. If you don't mind me asking you guys, what are you guys thinking about Mikael right now? Um, you know, the big talk around the world is, um, you know, we gave up so much for him. I'm a huge yeah. believer in Mikael. I still am one of those pieces that could just seamlessly fit in the puzzle, but – you know, there are nights, like last night was one of them. It's like, man, we know what you can do. We know what you're capable of, especially when you don't have the burden of being the number one option. In Phoenix, you were the third option. You guys went to the finals. You know, in Brooklyn, you were the number one option. It was rough. You're here with us. You're back to being the third option easily. And what what are we – I don't know. I mean, I, I love Macau. <laughs> My jersey's on the way in the mail. But, like, what what are we <laughs> – what are we seeing? You know, I, I, I need that to work. We all do as Nick yeah. fandom. We need that to work for the 2000 picks. We gave up. We need that to work. I'll just say quickly, it surprised me a little bit uh, watching that Houston game where Fred, Van, Fred Van Vliet um, got going early on. And, and mm -hmm. I saw bridges on him on a few of those possessions that surprised me a bit. And then, you know, last night the, there were a few instances where uh, he seemed to lose his guy either in a pick and roll switching situation, not switching, or or, or just in a scramble. Uh, so that it surprised me a little bit. Like nobody's perfect, but the some of the individual defense or the defense within the context of the five man unit 
I thought that it would be, you know, at a certain level. And it's not fair to expect that every game. Everybody makes mistakes, but it surprised me a little bit. John, your thoughts on on Bridges? Yeah, I mean, offensively, just to go on the other side of the court for a second, other than above the break threes, he's been he's been outstanding. I'm looking at it right now. Cleaning the glass has him. He's 75% at the rim, 55% on short mid-rangers. Um you know, he's only taking a couple of long twos, but he's perfect from there. He's hitting, the guy's hitting 60% from the corners, which is absurd, but he's four for 24 out above the break threes. Now, that is an issue. I completely agree with you on the point of attack defense and navigating picks, uh, navigating screens. That has been an issue. You traded all this stuff for him, not because he is a superstar, not because he is an elite shot creator, or not even because he's like a, an above average, well, I guess above average shot creator, but you traded for him because... He does, you could argue, more things well than just about anybody else in the league. Like you, There is so little or it, it, arguably nothing that Mikal Bridges takes off the table when he is going right. So the fact that there are these couple of holes in his game thus far, where you have your, your point of attack defense has been underwhelming, your above the break three-point shooting has been underwhelming, that's enough to... To, to to I mean, I feel bad saying this, kind of torpedo his effectiveness. Because if he's not doing everything at, at at least a certain level, then a lot of the thinking behind how this team was built, I think, starts to fall apart at both ends of the floor. Because you need, you need him to do all of the things that you've relied upon. And I know that's asking a lot, but... Six first round picks, you know, you you expect to to get a lot, you know, when you when you exactly. pay that price. Exactly. Yeah. Expectations are definitely high, Sky. Thank you for that question. Uh, we have a few more questions from our fans on this talkback session that we will conclude the show with. We have your questions, guys, that we're going to get into right here. We will start off with the cooler. Uh, here's a question for all of you. What are your thoughts on Tibbs going with a 7-8 man rotation in November? Playing guys 38 minutes a night already is insane. Guys are looking gassed in the fourth quarter. Uh, minutes are always going to be a topic when, with Tom Thibodeau teams. You seeing what the cooler is seeing, John, or do you see this as not really something to think about yet? I mean, <laughs> who else is he going to play? You know, yeah. who else is he going to play? Like this is this is a incredibly thin team. Depth was an issue before campaign went down, before Precious Achua went down, before Landry Shamit went down. And now you have a very, very, very clear hierarchy of a top six and then everybody else. And the everybody else ain't very good. And it's not going to help you win games. So you could sit here and you could say, oh, well, 38, 39 minutes, that's too much. Got to keep it at 35. You know, create some ridiculous arbitrary number. Um, last night was the ninth or the ninth day of the road trip, I think, for them. Right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And I think you sh you saw that. I'm not worried because the question of is it sustainable for the whole season? It doesn't need to be sustainable for the whole season for two reasons. One, the NBA has now built into his schedule because of the NBA Cup a span of ten days where every team in the league only plays two games, unless you make the championship of that thing, and in which case you would you would play a third game. But so there is a built in. It's, it's almost kind of like an, a second all-star break like earlier in the season where teams are going to be able to catch their breath. And wouldn't you know it, right after that is when NBA trade season starts, uh, December 15th. So I, I think, you know, I, I know we haven't talked trades too much. Um, I think they will make a move. I think they will figure out a way to bring in some sort of reinforcement. Um, and then you could start to, and then you could start to wind those guys down. Uh, and look, eventually, if the plan, if this goes according to plan, the starting unit will coalesce. They will play better when they are on the floor together, and they will start to make more with their minutes so that you don't need to play them as many minutes to milk their effectiveness. Like, that's where I stand on this. That sound it seems like uh, seems like a fair expectation. Uh, Sky, we've got one for you from Anytime Knicks, uh, my buddy on Twitter. He wants to know, what can Tibbs do to get these guys more motivated on defense? We made a lot of mistakes in our rotations. Your thoughts there, Sky? I don't know because when you're looking at Tibbs, you got to assume that he's doing everything. You know the type of <laughs> – the type of maniac he is, and I mean that in a complimentary way, you know the type of maniac he is when it comes to defense. So I got to think he's doing everything behind the curtains to to 
get them where they need to be. And, and, and I think they want to play defense the right way. They want to be who they were last year. They want to be that gritty, hard 1994 team, tough as nails, lunch pail, Tim's construction, going to work every day. But I, I think the shakeup, I really think the shakeup, as great as it is to have Cat, and I'm not putting any of this on him because he was thrown in the water and he's a superstar, in, in my opinion, as someone that we needed. And he was on that short list of guys that we knew Leon would go after when he got here. But I think the shakeup just changed so much of the identity, like Jonathan said, and like we've been saying all this time. They just, they got to get more familiar with one another. And it seems weird because you're only talking about, you know, one guy. You're just talking about Cat. And I'm again, I'm not putting it on him, but... The starting lineup, well, no, nah, Mikhail. I'm, yeah, that's two. Um, so, you know, you, you, you're talking about a, a, you know, you still got Brunson, you still got Hart, you still got McBride, you still got OG, even, you know, but it just seems so different now. And how do we get back to what it was? Knowing it won't go back to what it was. Like you said, it's a whole different team, the identity, the fabric, it's going to be different. But how do we get some of that energy and synergy back? with this new brand of Nick basketball. I, I don't know, I, I, but there's a way, there's gotta be a way. Yeah, with Thibodeau and, and motivating these guys, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily go there. They're adults, they're pro athletes. The motivation right. should come from within and come within that locker room. Uh, but I think that the challenge for Thibodeau and the Nick staff is how do you accentuate your strengths defensively and cover up for some of your non-strengths and it starts with in and OB and bridges obviously and, and how can you um, put those guys in best position to have uh, team success on defense and Josh Hart as well and then with the towns or, or with the Jalen Brunson like how, how can you best put those guys in position where again the five-man union is having success that's where I think the coaching comes in not necessarily motivation, uh, but maybe I'm off there, but that's how I see it. And I, we got one more here from C. Diaz 3. He says, Precious Achua is on week three with a hamstring. What is the update? Now, Precious Achua did travel with the Knicks on this road trip. Tom Thibodeau told reporters that he's been on the court, been doing some things on the court, but hadn't practiced yet. Uh, as of the middle of this road trip, I don't think he's practiced since then. That's the next hurdle for Achua to get cleared, to practice, to get cleared, to take contact. And then once you get there, uh, it's how does your body respond and it's conditioning. So I don't think he's on the precipice of returning, let's say Friday against Milwaukee or Sunday against Indiana, because he still does have to practice and start to take contact and see how his body responds to that. So don't think you'll see him this weekend. He's certainly been missed. The campaign has been missed as well. Uh, he's obviously closer to getting back to the court than Achua is. We'll see what his status is for Friday in against Milwaukee. And that's where we're going to leave it. Uh, I really want to thank Sky Zoo and John Macri for joining us. Uh, we're going to see what this team looks like this weekend. Three and four is not mm -hmm. the start record-wise that I'm sure the organization envisioned, but as Sky Zoo, as John talked about, there's time for these guys, plenty of time for these guys to get it together. So, John, Sky, thank you very much. And uh, and we'll be back uh, later this month with another putback, and we will have some mailbags coming up too. Uh, but before we go, I uh, just want to say a few words about my friend, Brendan Brown. Uh, Brendan Brown, uh, unfortunately, suddenly passed away on Sunday. And if you're a Nick fan, I'm sure you know Brown's work because he was a commentator for this team, TV, mostly radio. Going back to 2008, uh, he also uh, was always involved in basketball in one way or another. He was an assistant coach, Wake Forest, assistant coach with his dad, Huey Brown, in Memphis, uh, and just loved the game. And I think if you, you listen to Brendan on a broadcast or you listen to him in his, his media spots with Mike Francesa and elsewhere, you always learn something about the game. And I was fortunate enough to get to know Brendan pretty well over the last year and a half. We talked about basketball a lot. Uh, he taught me a lot. It was great to, to see the game through his eyes, learn about the game through his eyes. And we also talked about uh, non-basketball things. We talked about life. And... As passionate as Brendan was about basketball, 
uh, he was more passionate about passionate about being a father. And uh, he just whenever we talked about our kids, my kids, uh, just being dads, you know, he just it was so important to him. And, and he, it was something that uh, he took so seriously and found so much joy from. And uh, that's what I think about when I think about Brendan. I think about the basketball. I think about uh, his family and uh, my heart goes out to Brendan's family and his friends. And uh, we will miss him here dearly. Uh, just, I, I wanted to talk to him last night about the, uh, the Hawks loss. And I'm, I'm sure I'm going to have that feeling a lot. And, uh, it's going to be leaving a big void for the New York basketball community. Uh, so we miss you, Brendan, uh, condolences. Uh, my heart is with you and your friends and your family. Uh, thanks everybody.